How's it going, everybody? Maxwell McGee here checking out Dragon Commander alongside Farm, and we are about to hop into our first match of this 2v2 multiplayer battle that we are playing. Farm's picking out his cards right now. Farm, what are you thinking? Well, that's right, Max. Uh, we're here. Uh, I'm the red guys. I'm actually protecting my country here from an invasion by blue. Um, at this point, I have five card slots on which I can play uh, multiple different cards. Uh, we have dragon cards. We have mercenary cards, which are additional units that only pop in for the battle. So I might play a couple of those. I might get some uh, armor mercenaries. There's five slots, two of which are blind. So these slots can't be viewed by other players. Um, I'm going to play one of my uh, good cards there, which is a mass heal card. It's a dragon skill that allows me to heal my units on the battlefield and I'll just add one more well maybe three additional grenadiers in here and people will be able to see my cards here but they won't see my uh, dragon skill card as you can see so we are also to clarify so we're playing as red and we're on an alliance with yellow green? with yellow that's yellow, correct so we're allied with uh, yellow and blue and green are our enemies at the point so we're gonna click ready and we're gonna head into combat Okay, so here we are on the battlefield. So this is pretty much uh, my base where I start out. These uh, huge brick buildings here, these are uh, capture points. So these are neutral to begin with, as you can see here. They're neutral to begin with, and uh, once you go near them, you start capturing them. Uh, there are various uh, capture points, so in this case, this is a, a harbor or a um, airfield uh, capture point. The smaller ones actually allow us to build turrets on top of them, and uh, the bigger ones actually allow us to build airfields, barracks, and factories as well. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try to uh, attack the uh, green team as soon as we can make sure they're out of our uh, hair send these guys to uh, follow their devastators and we're going to build something very important which is a uh, recruitment center now in the top you can see a, uh, uh, a digit here that says like 2275 so this number actually represents the amount of population that is in this country at this point these recruitment centers uh, take recruits from the population and everybody shares the same population amount. So the more recruitment centers you actually have, the more recruits you can get from this population. So that's exactly what we're doing here, trying to capture these points which are specific to uh, the population. Now what determines the starting amount of resources you have to work with? Well, what determines is um, I was protecting this country with a bunch of uh, armor units and a bunch of hunters. So first of all, that part of the board game, of the strategy map, uh, is the startup value, the initial value of this phase. If you have enough of those units, you don't need to play any mercenary cards. If you don't, you'll actually have to do with what you have. And uh, of course the cards that you bring along is also a very important resource to start the game with. So as you can see they're already mobilizing here and I really have to start uh, creating some uh, more units. So right now I'm going to uh, enter the dragon mode, I'm going to fly in and nuke the enemy balloons. I'm going to, oh, Oh, but they managed just a to take, tad second too late. take yeah. your center right at the last second. That's right. So I'm just going to make sure I take out these guys as I can. I'm going to heal my units. I'm going to cast a heal that will heal them. Afar, this is a pretty dramatic transition you just made here into this dragon form. Are you going to be able to, I was about to ask, switch back out to We the... can switch back out at any time. Okay. Um, at this point I didn't die, so I can uh, rejoin the battle at any point near my own units. Is there any sort of cooldown, or can you really just swap freely at will? You can swap freely anytime you want. The only problem is when you die, it uh, costs recruits, so you have to sacrifice population in order to respawn immediately. Okay. As you can see, they're already attacking my uh, recruitment center here. Green and yellow are already in combat. We're going to take out green. And I'm going to heal my building. Ah, I'm on the cooldown. So this is the green units. They can't heal it at this point, but I can try to protect it. So this is pretty safe. Hey, yellow, that's my building. <laughs> oh, excellent. <laughs> So Now is that the yellow enemy dragon we're seeing over there in the distance? No, the yellow is a friendly dragon. And oh, basically, yellow, yeah, that's right, he's our ally. He destroyed all the green units, so I just healed my uh, recruitment center. And this one is still functional. As you can see, I'm making quite some cash, and it's about now that I really have to start making more units. I'm going to build a harbor here. A harbor allows me to build uh, juggernauts and ironclads. 
These units are fantastic because the Ironclad is a natural antidote against aerial units and um, the Juggernaut basically is a huge battleship that can shoot across the map and if you add a Zeppelin to it, he can even fire further. Now how do you help the player sort of juggle between controlling the Dragon and controlling the units? Like how do you help them manage those two roles? Well, how do we help them? Yeah, like, can you queue up orders for your ground units that they'll then execute while you're in Dragon? Well, yeah, form? basically you have all the stuff that any other RTS has as well. So you have rally points that you can determine. So in this case, I can just set the rally point of my uh, factory to more in the battlefield. Okay. And while I uh, create more units, they'll automatically head out there. So as I did here. So these guys are already going to provide some serious backup here. And I'm going to rebuild my recruitment center. And I think this is an excellent moment to start taking out uh, the enemy turret. There's an enemy dragon in the sky. I'm going to take him out. Guys, any backup here? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so as you can see, my guys are taking over uh, the turret point. I'm going to start building a turret within the enemy base, move them closer. So I can just get them a bit closer and oh, shoot. Oh, no, it's just too no. late. So close, you were so close. Almost about to heal them. Now, do you ever see anybody go for a all units, no dragon playstyle? Is that even a possibility? That is a possibility. Uh, the final game will have multiple dragons to support uh, any different playing style the player has. So uh, the idea is really that uh, you find a way that, you, uh, uh, that you're comfortable in playing. So you'll have four dragon types, a more supportive dragon for the player that likes RTS more. Um, and of course, choosing these dragons also have implications for uh, your army. So a more uh, uh, powerful dragon has a uh, uh, modifier on your army that makes them actually do less damage in the actual uh, RTS bits. So this whole uh, thing will be balanced out to cater for different playing styles. So if people don't want to play with the dragon, that's also possible. But you'll have to, you know, you'll have to get in there and get dirty anyway <laughs> if you want you it or not. You have to get your hands dirty while exactly. We're so we're, uh, we're destroying the green base and taking over uh, the buildings here. I really need an airfield. I'm going to start building some bombers. Now it looks like we really accomplished a lot there with just a very limited number of units. Um, is that sort of typical for, for unit deployment? You sort of have these smaller, smaller focus groups? Well, you'll have to, uh, because you, you're, you're active on a couple of different fronts at the same time. So it's quite hard to uh, concentrate on huge battles, but you can, because we have uh, one guy on our team, our lead QA. He's uh, quite an accomplished and competitive uh, uh, StarCraft II player, and he really loves to play it more in a uh, very... Uh, so he can sort of juggle all of those exactly, roles very exactly, quickly. Exactly, in a very serious way. Um, yeah. And most of us uh, don't really play it in that way, but he actually switches through the dragon quite fast as well. And we also have things like control groups and all the other stuff that you naturally expect from any other uh, RTS. So, so, so sort of catch us up on what the, the lay of the battlefield looks like now. It looks like we really dealt a lot of damage at to the green point, player. Did they, yeah. they out of the match at this point? Well, at this point, uh, if I was them, I would really uh, give up because uh, <laughs> we're pretty much boxing them in. Now it looks like blue player still has a mass of troops over there on the far side of that cliff. Yeah, but he's not going to do anything with them because we're going to build our build our turrets there to create some confusion. Yeah, looks like we've also got a yellow dragon in the skies. Give yes, us giving us some backup. That's oh, perfect. Here comes enemy blue dragon. Blue dragon seems like he wants to uh, do something. Uh, but that's okay because we're going to build a harbor here and create some uh, a juggernauts so they can shoot across the battlefield. Now, once you built new units in this, in this, uh, during this battle, are those yeah. units? If you have any left over when the battle's over, are they going to translate into units that you can use on the warm out? Well, that's the thing, right? So we have a. Um, hold on, let me just take care of this. Sure thing. Just, just let, let you mop nuke, up here. Nuke the enemy dragon. There you <laughs> go. And that's perfect. Nuke sniping. That's pretty and good. As you can see, uh, the battleships are already starting to fire at uh, the defensive units, and yellow can actually move in to uh, sweep up the rest. But uh, yeah, that was a valid question. Uh, actually, we have a way uh, to calculate the survival rate of uh, the player. Okay. And um, so if you attack a country with like uh, five uh, armor units and you have a survival rate of 50 or 60 percent, that means that after the battle you get to keep 50 or 60 okay. percent of the units you came on with. So it's pretty important to keep in mind how many units you're making and how much damage you're dealing and how much damage you're getting. 
And that way you couldn't just drum up a whole army of units and have them pop up out of nowhere when exactly. you're done. Yeah. Exactly. So that was one combat round, and uh, we were victorious. Congratulations. All right, fine. Here we are back again on the strategic map, the war map, if you will. Victorious from battle, start of our second turn. What are we going to do? Well, that's true, Max. Uh, what we're going to do here is, uh, first of all, uh, we had quite some uh, uh, losses here. Uh, I'm the red guy, so these are the countries that I occupy. Uh, every country has a gold revenue, which is represented in the bag of gold, and a population. Now, the more countries you actually own, uh, the higher your gold revenue is. And in this case, this is the second turn, and we can see that these transport ships uh, loaded with units are actually moving to my shores. I'm going to send some units to uh, uh, this country in order to uh, back it up a bit more. Um, on your capital, so this is this is uh, my capital and this is my capital building, we can actually buy units. So it's also a factory, so we can start buying some units here. Now is that ex exclusively where new units are, are produced? Well no, you also have buildings that are factory buildings. For instance, this building is a factory building and once you uh, take that, or uh, in this case we can actually build one uh, to uh, shorten the supply. Ah, oh, we don't have enough money. So we'd need 25 gold in order to uh, build a factory here so we can shorten the supply lines, but that's okay. We have plenty of units that can move uh, uh, across the countries. So all the units also have uh, movement points. So the moment you actually uh, make them, they have a certain amount of movement points. The Devastators have one movement point, so you can only move them through one country. Uh, armors and Hunter units have actually more movement points. You can load them into transport, so if we uh, go to the unit list, we actually have ground units here, as well as uh, aerial units, so we also have two air units, and we also have naval units, so in this case I'm just going to make one extra transport, and we also had a bunch that were on the way to the blue capital, so I'm going to move my transport on this country here, um, you know, unload the transport, and then attack his uh, capital, so he probably won't be expecting that because he's moving all his forces to the right. Yeah, it is, it is quite a sneak attack. So what is this, uh, this tower building over here? Yeah, so that's what I wanted to say. These buildings uh, on the map, they have different functions. So this is the wizard tower. Uh, the wizard tower actually gives you dragon skill cards every turn. So if you own one, you get the dragon skill cards. You got gold mines. Uh, these increase the revenue of a country by 50%. You got shops. So if you uh, take a country with a shop, you can right click on it and then you can actually uh, buy uh, generated cards. Uh, there'll be multiple to your disposal. We also have the academies. Uh, these decrease research costs. Um, we also have the taverns. The taverns give you uh, mercenary cards. These are uh, units that uh, are temporarily available for one combat. And we also have the parliament. The parliament uh, gives you strategy cards which are, which are really political. So in this case, if I go to Hawkesbury, I can actually play a card on Hawkesbury that makes it uh, immune to evasions for one uh, turn, which is really good because if I get attacked, at least we're protected here, right? Uh, cards are a very essential part of the gameplay. Uh, during the single player and multiplayer, there's different ways of getting cards. You either get them through uh, uh, your faction members, the princess, uh, or your uh, generals in the single player. In multiplayer, you get them by actually owning countries and uh, owning the buildings on the countries. There's plenty of different cards that influence the battle heavily, so it's, uh, it's quite useful to keep an eye on those uh, things. We can also access our uh, unit research menu. The unit research menu uh, in Dragon Commander, we basically have a, uh, you know, a, a, a uh, basic army for everyone, so everyone has the same army, no different factions, but every unit in this army has about four to five different upgrades, and you can't have them all, so you really have to choose how am I going to play and what am I going to upgrade in order to facilitate that type of gameplay. So while two players may have similar units, they could play Absolutely. completely Very differently. Different upgrades. That is absolutely right. Um, buying these upgrades can either go instantly, so if you have enough cash, you can unlock them immediately. You can uh, research it over two turns, you can research it over one turn. Um, shorter research is, of course, more expensive. And we also have our dragon skills uh, at our disposal that we can also uh, upgrade and research, and more will unlock during the progression of the game. So uh, we're just going to end our turn now to see what is going on. And on that note, Farm, as we're uh, as we're sort of progressing into the next turn, can you uh, remind the viewers at home when they can expect more information about Dragon Commander? Everything goes well. <laughs> Dragon Commander will be released.